So thanks everybody for attending our panel. We're gonna be talking about ICE out, stopping US immigration and customs enforcement, collusion with local law enforcement. And on behalf of the ICE out campaign and the Austin Immigrant Rights Coalition, we wanna thank you for attending. And this is, this is a really exciting opportunity for us. There's been, we've been organizing a campaign for about the last two years to put an end to ICE presence in the local jails. For about the last year, we've been actively involved in producing a collaborative activist research report, focusing on the effects on the immigrant community of these federal policing programs. And this is our very, very first public presentation of the preliminary research findings. So it's a really exciting moment for us. Now we have two goals for this presentation. One, we want to recruit you into the project. So if you're interested, come and talk to us. Uh, we're passing out a brochure. Uh, Patty's going to be passing out a brochure that details the problem and the overall context and what we've been doing. Now, second goal of our panel, addressing the broader thematic of the Aubrey and Brecha conference we want to call the audience's attention to the challenges and contradictions of doing activist research. Now, this is a problematic that's run throughout our entire campaign. Some of us are academics, some of us are organizers, some of us straddle that boundary, and it's not always been an easy boundary to negotiate. And I think it's really important to highlight a quote from an activist scholar, Ruthie Gilmore, so I wanted to quote from her. She writes in one of her recent books, the direction of research does not necessarily follow every lead proposed from the grassroots, nor do the findings necessarily reinforce community activists closely held hunches about how the world works. Rather, in scholarly research, the answers are only good as the further questions that they provoke, whereas for activists, Answers are only good as a further tactics that they make possible. But it's, she says that it's where activism and scholarship overlap, that this is the key area for decisions about what comes next. So this is a tension that we've definitely had to grapple with throughout our work. Now, a brief note on chronology in terms of how our presentation is structured. We've, as part of the campaign as a whole, had two basic strategic approaches. We'll refer to these as strategy one, which includes a broad-based community alliance to put an end, to directly target the sheriff of Travis County, to put an end to his voluntary participation in these programs. That's strategy one. Strategy two came a bit later, and it originated with the idea to create a collaborative, community-driven research um, research report, an activist research report that would show the negative effects of these programs on the immigrant community and also draw out their implications for Austin Police Department's work in the Travis counties. Now, let me briefly introduce our team of researchers, organizers, and activists. My name is Jason Cato, and I'm on the board of the Austin Immigrant Rights Coalition, and I'm also a PhD candidate in the program in activist anthropology at UT. And I've participated in this project for the last year with the beginning of the research report. Carolyn Keating, right here, is the coordinator of the Austin Immigrant Rights Coalition. And she's old school. She's been involved in the project from the very beginning. Uh, Andrea Guten is an attorney and she received her MA in Latin American Studies at UT, and she's been involved in the project for several years as well. Her report was just issued today, right? Yesterday. Just issued yesterday on the effects of CAP in, in Travis County. Uh, you could pick that up. We asked for donations, would be really helpful. Next is John Reyes. John's a research intern uh, for the ICE Out campaign and committee and he's also a community organizer for the Austin Immigrant Rights Coalition, and he's also in the program of activist anthropology as an undergraduate. And he's been in this project for about a year, year and a half. Patricia Zavala is a worker rights organizer 
for the Workers' Defense Project, and she's also on the board for the Austin Immigrant Rights Coalition. And she's been involved in this project for the past year as well. Now, let me introduce two very special guests, Rose and Giovanni. They are immigrant leaders who have actively participated in the organizing dimensions of the Ice Out campaign. And let me turn it over to them. They're gonna give a testimony about an encounter with local law enforcement very recently that's led to the deportation of one of their close friends. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Giovanni Mendoza. Yo soy de Honduras. Y estoy agradecido aquí con los amigos por invitarme a contarles mi historia. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Giovanni Mendoza. Um, I'm from Honduras. Um, thank you very much. I thank my friends here for having me come and be able to tell you my story. Uh, mi uh, historia comienza hace dos meses que mi amigo me habló que tuvo un accidente y pues yo fui al punto del incidente donde eh, estaba él un poco nervioso. My story starts two months ago when my friend called me. Um, he had been in a car wreck. I went to the incident where it happened and he was very nervous. Y yo fui, le pregunté si él estaba bien y él nervioso me dijo que sí. Pero lo que más me impactó fue como un sheriff lo agarró, lo esposó y lo metió al, al carro como si fuera un animal. Um, I went to my friend, I asked him if he was okay. He nervously told me that he was. Um, what impacted me the most was how the sheriff just went up to him, put him in can handcuffs and threw him in the car as though he were an animal. Y de este, no le preguntó el sheriff si necesitaba atención médica. Eh, de pronto el sheriff me dijo que me retirara, que, que me retirara de donde estaba el incidente. Um, the sheriff didn't even ask my friend if he needed medical attention. Uh, soon after that, the sheriff um, told me to leave the area where the incident had happened. Y yo le pregunté a mi amigo que por qué se lo llevaba y al, al policía y me dijo el policía que porque no tenía licencia. Pero yo estoy seguro que él tenía licencia y aseguranza de su carro. Um, I asked my friend and the police officer why he was being taken away. The police officer told me he was taken because he didn't have a license, but I know that my friend does have a license and his car was insured. Y el policía me dijo que al siguiente día iba a salir de la cárcel y fue mentira porque al tiempo de hoy y mi amigo está en Honduras deportado. The police officer told me that my friend would be released from jail the very next day, but that was a lie because my friend still hasn't been here. He's been deported to Honduras. Y este y Yo estoy enojado y a la misma vez estoy, eh, me da miedo ya el, eh, la policía. Si, porque si le hicieron eso a mi amigo, pienso que la siguiente vez voy a ser yo, o no sé. Um, I'm very angry at what happened, but at the same time I'm also afraid because the next time um, that the police comes, it could be me that they're taking away. Porque yo pienso que es una injusticia lo que el policía hizo en arrestarlo solo porque no tenía licencia, supuestamente, pero él tenía su licencia. Y pues estoy asustado por eso. Y yo, yo eh, quisiera que si mirara un policía, alejármele. For not having a license, although he did have a license, and so now I'm afraid of police. That if I see a police officer, I'm gonna go out of my way to avoid him. Y si yo llego al uh, llego ver un policía que viene detrás de mí, yo digo a doblar a la a otra calle por no traerlo atrás o al frente de mí, porque no sé si pueda pasarme lo mismo a mí. If I see a police officer driving behind me. I'm going to turn right into another street or if he's in front of me so that I don't, um, so that the same thing doesn't happen to me. Porque, o si miro 
que una persona le está haciendo algo a otra persona, yo no le voy a hablar a la policía porque yo pienso que el policía se va a, va a pensar que soy yo el, el, el que está haciendo algo malo. And if I see, if I witness somebody saying something to somebody else, I'm not going to call the police because the police might think it's me that's doing something wrong. Yeah, y este, pues ahora me da miedo irme a mi trabajo en la mañana, salir, eh, irme para mi trabajo porque no sé si pueda regresar a mi casa o pueda ir a la cárcel por algo que no, no, no es correcto. Um, and now every day when I'm leaving the house to go to work, I'm afraid. I'm afraid when I go to work because I don't know if I'm going to come back or if I'm going to go to jail um, for something that just isn't isn't fair, is unjust. Yes, es, esa es mi historia. Y gracias. And that's my story. Thank you. Um, I was with my husband the night of a friend's car accident, and um, I just wanted to share, you know, my feelings, my perspective on what happened and um, after our friend got arrested um, the sh one of the sheriffs came to talk to talk to me because I told him I had some questions and he just came and talked to me with like an attitude and just like like I was bothering him and I just said why is our friend getting arrested and he said because he has no license and I said, he's a good friend of ours, and we know him well, and he does have a license. It's just not from this country. It's not a Texas license. And he said, well, I know for a fact that it is, it's false because you can go buy them at the flea market. You can go buy them, you know, online. And, and I just said, no, that's not right. He said, we have no way to check to see if they are, um, if they're real. We can only check um, U.S. licenses. And I just said, why is he being arrested? Because he's not a criminal. He didn't do anything wrong. And he just said, because he has no license and because he caused a car accident. And I just said, um, well, he does have an international driver's license from Honduras. And he just got, he even got more aggravated with me and was like, um, he just said, well, well, where are you from? <clears throat> you know, where, do you have an international driver's license? And that it's like he was trying to intimidate me, and it didn't intimidate me at all. It just made me a lot more angry and outraged, but I had to control myself and my words. And um, I, me and my husband made a complaint next few days with the sheriff's office, and I spoke with someone there, and he was very nice. He was very polite, but he tried to pretty much explain away what had happened. Um, he had told me that the, the sheriff I had spoken with was new and he didn't necessarily know you know it was how to speak to someone correctly and I said well to me I said you should be treating someone with the respect that he wants to be given in return he shouldn't be trying to intimidate me or do anything like that and he said that he would get back to me to find out you know what would happen next and tell me what happened and I didn't hear from him uh, I just felt like I needed to make a complaint, try to do something, you know, because what happened wasn't right. I feel what happened to our friend was a case of racial profiling. Um, you know, I just, I just didn't think it was right at all. Um, right now I'm in school to get my associates in criminal justice, and it's always been a great interest of mine, but um, I'm very seriously considering not going into this field because I've had so many bad experiences with uh, local law enforcement, APD, and the sheriff. Um, it just made me very angry, very outraged, and it just made me, I'm ashamed to call myself American because of so many people that are racist and ignorant and closed-minded. Um, sometimes I even get the feeling, you know, I talk to my husband, I said, let's just go to your country. I'm tired of living here because it's just so, it's so bad. I mean, this, this incident affected me very deeply on a personal level and because my husband isn't legal um, every day that he leaves for work you know I'm very afraid and scared and worried that he won't come home to me you know and I just don't think it's right that the um, local law enforcement targets illegal immigrants thinking they're all drug dealers they're all child abusers you know they, they rob and steal because 
I know for a fact that's not true. You know, a lot of them are here to work and make a better life for themselves and their families. And that's the case with my husband. Um, it's just my feeling. I believe very strongly that, you know, every person, it doesn't matter where they're from, if they were born here in the United States or not, you know, everyone has a chance for a better life. They should be able to come here if they follow the rules, they should be able to become legal easily. And it's my belief that no human being is illegal. Um, I just want to do whatever I can to try to help in any way possible. Thank you. Okay, again, my name is Jason. And I would like to very quickly go over what, what is CAP, what are Circular Communities, and then this other thing, 287G, what are these programs, where do they come from, and what kinds of effects do they have for, for the state, for racism, and for the, how immigrant rights organizers are responding to these. So let me mention three key ICE programs. One is 287G. Jail Task Force, the other's Criminal Alien Program, and then there's Secure Communities. Now, these are all jail status check programs. They all use different means, whether that's technology, interviews by the agents, or basically interrogations, or the cross-designation of local police to act as immigration enforcers. And they all use those technological means towards the same end of screening inmates who are brought into the jails and putting them into deportation proceedings. Now, with respect to 287G, 287G is a jail status check program, but there's another component to it that's significant. It can allow ICE to cross-deputize local on-the-ground agents as immigration officials. What that means is that your, your cop on the beat can question you directly about your immigration status. Now, the other two programs CAP and SCOM are different. They are only jail status programs. What that means is that they use, in the case of CAP, uh, question and answer interrogations with people brought into the jails with secure communities. It's a technologically intensive version of CAP. It uses biometric database surveillance systems. Now, a, a few numbers on these. CAP has existed in one form or another since at least the 1980s, but it's been transformed and it's being eclipsed by Secure Communities. Secure Communities is the newest initiative and it's going to be available in 81 jurisdictions in nine states. ICE plans to have ESCOM in every single state by 2011 and it plans to implement it in each of the 3,100 state and local jails across the country by 2013. So we're talking about a major infrastructure being phased in in the next two years. Now in Travis County, the INS, which has now been recodified, reinstitutionalized as ICE, has been working with the sheriff since 1999. After 9-11, ICE's presence in the county jails significantly intensified, especially in 2006, 2007. And as of June 2009, just this past summer, we received notification that Travis County enlisted in secure communities. So with respect to Travis County, we have CAP and secure communities. We do not have 287G. So what are the implications of these programs for state power racism and immigrant rights organizing? I want to talk mainly as an anthropologist and mention three key, very broad aspects to that are essential for understanding how modern immigration policing relates to neoliberalism. Now, the first thing that I want to mention has to do with neoliberal state corporate articulations or how the state and corporations partnership with each other. If we think about neoliberalism in the 80s, 90s, and after 9-11, you could usefully think about it in terms of a hard form of neoliberalization, which means a deepening of socioeconomic marginalization, racist state projects intensify. An example here would be the prison industrial complex in its transformation from the 70s 
and then into the 80s, 90s, and afterwards. The second way of thinking about neoliberalism is a more soft version of neoliberalism, about how neoliberalism transforms the nature of policing, especially the local police. And here, we have to mention the role of the security technologies industry. Private corporations are designing the biometric surveillance systems that local police on the ground are using. Now, what is significant about these two things? Cap and secure communities are, you cannot understand them without thinking about the relations between the prison industrial complex and the securities technologies industry. Now, how? Like, what is the connection there? So, with the case of of the prison industrial complex, think about what, what the role is of CAP. It basically acts as a filter or a pipeline that pushes people, that targets immigrants in their communities and workplaces on the street, and it places them into jails. And then if ICE is in those jails through CAP and secure communities, then it basically provides a capturing net that can transfer people from those jails into an immigrant detention complex that's largely managed and run by private corporations. So there's a direct pipeline that's created from immigrant communities to the prison industrial complex through these. Now in terms of the local police, what's happening, particularly in Travis County, with the case of, of CAP being in the local jails, this is a technology designed by private corporations, managed by private corporations, but oper operationalized by the state. So CAP, in a sense, is a product of how ne neoliberalism reshapes the nature of the state in its relationship to private corporations and in the broader public community as a whole. Now, what is the significance of this for, for organizing? What it means is that these programs are rescaling state power second point here. Now, what does that mean? It means that prior to the emergence of these programs, it was federal immigration authorities that did the work of federal immigration policing. But now, local law enforcement officers are being enlisted to do the work of federal immigration. So what we're talking about is a shift or recuperation of the local to do the work of the federal. This is very significant. Now, immigrant rights organizers in response have to grapple with that tension. Do we work on a grassroots level or do we work on a federal level? What, what are the ways in which we grapple with those, especially in the context of our uh, crackdown and criminalization against immigrants in our own communities? So this is a very broad problematic that, that our campaign has had to grapple with. Now the second point that I want to mention about the connection between immigration policing and neoliberalism has to do with policy and laws. What we're finding is that there's a blurring of the boundaries between certain spheres. Two examples here would be how immigration is policed on the U.S.-Mexico border. What the general trend that we've seen from the very heyday beginnings of neoliberalism to its institutionalization now to its breakdown is that the drug war and drug policy has determined how we relate to immigration. So effectively there's been a militarized response to policing what's effectively a civil issue and drug policy is a major role in that. Now that's with the U.S.-Mexico border policies. Now in the domestic sphere something very similar is going on with the effects of the criminalization of immigration via drug policies, particularly in the 1980s and also in the 1990s, we had a series of different policies um, or, or legal acts put in place that criminalized, um, running out of time, get a skip. So what, Mention this local police. Now, on a cultural level, this is significant because what we have is both constructions of the immigrant as a dangerous criminal other. Rose mentioned this, the feelings that she has, but this is also working itself out on an institutional level. 
Now, the last point that I want to mention has to do with the changing forms of racism, or what we could call neo-racism. 80% of APD arrests put people in Travis County facilities. But it's not APD that's enrolled in cap and secure communities. It's the Travis County Sheriff's Department. So we have a fragmentation of the state or the jurisdictions of the state. Now that's significant from an organizing perspective because how can we say that APD is racist when they're just doing their job? And how can we say that they're racist when cap and secure communities don't work with an explicit racial logic. They screen everyone who comes into the jail. The difference with 287G is a cop can see a person on the street and be like, hey, you look undocumented, I'm gonna question you. That's not what's happening with cap and secure communities. And that introduces very distinct challenges as, for us as organizers. Now, let me turn it over to our next presenter uh, Caroline, and she's going to talk about some of the first set of strategies. That yeah. Thanks, Jason. Um, so again, my name is Caroline, and I'm the coordinator of the Austin Immigrant Rights Coalition. And this issue locally became um, a concern for us in the beginning of 2008. January 2008, basically Sheriff Hamilton, who has control over the jail, publicly announced that he was going to give office space to ICE officials, you know, 24-7 access, and he did this very publicly. And then all of a sudden, these um, organizations like the coalition and immigration attorneys started to be very concerned about the effects that would have on the immigrant community, particularly, you know, as, as Rose and Giovanni um, gave their testimony, you know, this, this has a potential of really dividing immigrant families. It has a potential uh, for racial profiling. It increases cost to taxpayers. And um, you know, it's, it's, in general, a major problem for the immigrant community. So we decided, OK, what, we got to plan a campaign around this. And we have our, our main target was Sheriff Hamilton, because we believe that this was a voluntary program that he entered into. And so we had a series of actions in 2008 um, so we gathered uh, signatures of support from about 50 organizations in Austin um, against this practice of offering ICE officials complete access to the jail. We had meetings with city council members, county commissioners, state representatives, our Congress people, the uh, police chief, uh, um, the police union president to get a lot more political support and to put a lot of pressure on the sheriff to change his ways. On May 1st, we organized a mass march past the jail um, with thousands of people in attendance. We had, we had uh, grassroots lobbying, having people call or email their elected officials to let them know that they were against this practice. Um, we gathered over 1,000 signatures and hand delivered them to the sheriff's office. And as a result of all this organizing, uh, we, did, we did have some outcomes that um, we're pretty proud of. You know, in the end, Sheriff Hamilton did not want to change his mind. Um, we sat down with him in October and November of 2008 and basically proposed to him, you know, of the people coming into the jail, is it possible to just look at classy misdemeanors post-conviction? At first, he seemed open to the idea, but at the second meeting, you know, he was, he was pretty obstinate. He wasn't going to change his mind. But in the end, we did get a few um, victories, one of which was APD decided to implement side, the side and release option, which basically means if you're stopped um, for a number of violations, they could be uh, class, I believe, class A and class B misdemeanors, you can get a ticket rather than being taken to the jail. And we see that as a victory because people can get the ticket and not have to end up going through the jail process and therefore being detected by ICE agents and detained and deported. So we saw that as, as a major victory, although it still is up to the discretion of police officers to, to use the citation option. And in, in, for example, in Giovanni's friend's case, the police officer decided to arrest the guy anyway, even though they had the option to give that citation. 
Um, and basically in the, the end of uh, 2008 and beginning of 2009, we kind of regrouped. We said, well, you know, the sheriff, he seems pretty abstinent. He doesn't want to change his mind. What are we going to do? What are the next steps? So we decided together to write a comprehensive report that looks at the way that this has affected the immigrant community, and we wanted a report that would engage the community in the process. So I'm going to turn it over to sort of the strategy to folks who have been working on the, the report, the community-based report. Hi, my name's Andrea Guten. I'm an attorney, recent graduate of the UT Latin American Studies Master's Program. I'm going to be talking about data that I got from the Travis County Jail. Um, my report over there, released yesterday, goes into a bit more detail. Um, so, Jason talked a little bit and Caroline talked a little bit about the problems that jail status check programs suffer from. These include, um, they threaten police safety as community trust breaks down, they encourage racial profiling, um, there's no oversight mechanism, and they're costly to counties. I'm gonna focus on how um, immigrants stop tr trusting police when everyone who's arrested, regardless of guilt or innocence or the severity of the crime, is eventually get taken over to ICE detention. Um, and I'm also gonna talk about the actual cost to the counties. Um, my presentation explores the problem these problems in the context of data from the Travis County Jail. I assessed over 300,000 records over an eight year period, um, focusing on the use of the detainer. So the detainer is the main tool of these jail status check programs. Um, it, once, when individuals are booked into the Travis County Jail, um, the Sheriff's Office provides ICE with a list of everyone who's foreign born. ICE then comes into the jail 24-7 to interview those people and places an immigration hold known as a detainer on people who it believes are deportable immigrants, deportable non-citizens. Um, so this detainer lets the jail know that ICE wants to take custody of that person once local custody from the jail ends. And that happens when a person's been found guilty or innocent or charges have been dropped or they've served out their jail time. Um, and it also has implications for bail release before trial, and I'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, so what the detainer does, in essence, is it gives ICE an extra 48 hours or two days to pick up a person from the jail once local charges have ended. Um, and so basically they're just staying in jail. Jail has no authority other than to wait for ICE to come pick them up for those two days. And I also want to point out that not everybody who's placed under detainer are undocumented immigrants. Jason um, talked a little bit about um, the legislative changes of the past two years that have criminalized immigrants, so that now some legal permanent residents and visa holders are deportable, even if they've been in the country for 20 years, because they committed a certain type of crime 15 years ago. Or they're deportable because they commit you know, a low-level misdemeanor, such as shoplifting in some cases. So to go back to one of the major problems with CAP is that while ICE claims that it's prioritizing dangerous criminals, in effect it's catching a much larger group of people. Um, a recent report from the Department of Homeland Security that just came out at the end of 2009 showed that 57% um, of all people identified through CAP had no criminal convictions. This is a program that's targeted at criminals and 57% had no criminal convictions. That's an increase from 53% the year before. Um, my data analysis from Travis County shows that also here a large percentage are not high-level offenders. These are all misdemeanors. Um, you can see it's a steady rise over the past few years. Um, in 2006, 34% were misdemeanors. In 2007, 38%, and now well over half, 58% are misdemeanors charged with um, who are placed under detainer. Um, Data from Irving, Texas, it's not my analysis, other reports have come out on this, show that in the first year that CAP was implemented there in 2006 and 2007, 12 and percent of everyone who was placed under detainer was for the offense of driving without a license or with an invalid or suspended license. And these in Texas are known as Class C misdemeanors, which are punishable by a maximum $500 fine or um, a, and no jail time. So. A recent report that came out also at the end of last year shows that 98% of everyone placed under detainer were misdemeanors. That means only 2% were felons, were arrested for felonies. Um, 
So all this data, what it shows is that the majority of people who are being swept up under CAP are not serious threats to our communities, to the safety of our communities. Um, and overall, the number of people who are being detained, who are being placed under detainer, has been increasing. Um, the number of 2008 detainers placed more than doubled from 2007, so that in 2008, over 2,000 people were placed under detainer. You know, and this data supports the anecdotes that Austin Immigrant Rights Coalition and other organizations had been hearing from the immigrant community. And the testimony that we heard today from both Giovanni and Rose, that even a minor brush with immigration enforcement can lead to detention and ultimately deportation. So the other question I researched was what is the cost to the counties of these jail status check programs? Um, and I looked at how much longer inmates were placed under detainers stay in the jail as compared to um, US citizen inmates. Um, and it might seem because I talked about how they can stay up to two days longer that they just stayed two days longer. But in effect, you know, a hidden consequence of the detainer is that immigrants under detainer are not being released in the pretrial period. They don't get bail. Usually if you're arrested, you can pay money to the court or be released without money to the court on your a personal bond um, so that you can go home, prepare your trial, meet with your, prepare your case, meet with your attorneys, and then come back um, for your case, for your trial date. But inmates under detainer are very unlikely to receive bail. They don't receive personal bonds, and it's very rare that they receive bonds where they have to pay money. In the rare instances where they do get bail, they still um, don't get to go home and you know make money and keep their jobs and you know prepare for their criminal defenses. They're transferred immediately to ICE immigration custody, where they're held until their deportation proceedings commence, or if they can pay an immigration bond, which can cost tens of thousands of dollars. Um, so this next slide shows the length of stay for ICE and non-ICE inmates in 2007. As you can see, ICE detainer inmates are staying much longer than non-ICE inmates. Um, I've broken it down by um, type of crime uh, arrested, and overall, it's about um, ICE detainers stay about three times as often. St sorry, stay three times as long as non-detainer inmates, and for misdemeanors in specific, they stay three and a half times as long. Um, and you know, this is the same a four-year comparative study that I did shows that overall they're staying three times as long. Um, and so in terms of the cost, um, I figured out the daily cost of housing of detainer inmates in the fiscal year 2008 to be $2.5 million. And there's a couple programs that reimburse the federal government, the state criminal alien assistance program and contract payments from Department of Homeland Security to the jail. Um, even after you look at those, it still costs $1.3 million to incarcerate um, ICE inmates under detainer. To put it into a different framework, to cost 100 inmates that year cost about $133,000. To house that same number of ICE detainers cost $394,000. And then once you take into account the reimbursements, it still costs $60,000 more per 100 inmates for ICE detainers. Um, so you know this data shows that local governments are paying higher incarceration rates, and because they're staying longer, this is also a contributing cause to overcrowding, which is a perennial problem in um, Texas jails throughout the state. Um, so just to conclude, my two main points, you know, if you want to take anything away from this presentation, is that ICE is not limited to targeting criminal offenders like it claims, um, and that the broad and unrestricted use of detainers is having a significant financial effect on counties. Thank you. My name is Don Reyes, and I'm an intern for the Austin American Rights Coalition and an undergraduate student here at the University of Texas in Anthropology. After looking at the data from Travis County Jails, the research team wanted to know what the effects were on the ground resulting from these programs. Part of the Strategy 2 report involves the use of focus groups and community surveys. The data gathered from this research evaluates how the relationship between the immigrant community and local law enforcement has deteriorated ever since these programs were implemented. So let me begin with the survey. The survey is part of our quantitative research and it assesses how these relationships have changed. Certain questions include the perception of local law enforcement and federal immigration authorities and also 
gauges the reluctance to call the police because of these programs. The surveys are distributed within our focus groups and meetings rather than randomly. While some may argue on the scientificity of this approach, we argue that it's necessary on an epistemological level because you need the context of trust in order to get these very intimate questions to be answered. Without this trust, it would be very difficult for immigrants to participate, as well as potentially skew the results of the survey. Thus far, we have conducted 30 immigrant surveys in the immigrant community. Our initial findings show some of the following trends. A majority of the respondents, in fact, 22 out of 30, responded that they knew that local law enforcement and ICE were working together. A majority also responded that they knew ICE was present in Travis County jails and expressed concern about this fact, saying that it builds mistrust and creates a fear of unjust persecution of immigrants. One participant expressed that the collaboration genera la oportunidad de que las personas que apliquen la ley lo hagan de acuerdo a sus creencias ideológicas y intereses o preferencias personales. That it allows law enforcement officials to apply their own discretion, and underlying this would be racial profiling. When asked if they would call the police today if they became a victim or witness to a crime, knowing that ICE was present in Travis County jails, over half responded that they would never call the police unless they were a victim of a crime. And an even smaller percentage from that figure said they would never call the police under any circumstance, neither victim nor witness. Now, we get a more subjective and personal approach through the focus groups. The focus group is a sociological research method that seeks to elicit the unexpressed private opinions of immigrant community in an open-ended dialogue. Through the focus groups, we're getting people together to share, to gather shared sentiments and interpretations of local law enforcement and federal immigration. The advantage of the focus group is that you're getting people to talk about something that's usually only talked behind closed doors. At the same time, it gives a desire to become involved in the research process. Strangers from similar backgrounds find themselves having very similar experiences resulting from the effects to themselves and their communities from these programs. And it builds a solidarity effect that allows this research process to gain power. The focus groups are formed in small groups of seven to 12 participants that take about an hour to complete and cover three general thematic topics. The three themes for the immigrant focus groups are, one, the collaboration between police and La Migra, two, community sphere, and three, safety and alternatives. Part one deals with the impressions of the immigrant community and how they see local law enforcement and federal immigration authorities, and evaluates the effectiveness and intentions of immigrant policies that collaborate with local law enforcement. Part two evaluates the resulting fear from these policies. How they become distanced from the local law enforcement and also how these policies undermine public safety. Finally, part three provides a space for dialogue on alternatives for, for these policies, as well as to develop better relationships between the immigrant community and the police, improving public safety. Thus far, we have conducted 10 focus groups with approximately 70 participants. Now, some of the findings. There's a general extent, um, there's a general fear throughout the community. Regardless of the participant knowledge of any ICE programs, there's general consensus that, that they know that ICE and local law enforcement are working together. Many rumors and stories of people that have been arrested and deported circulate throughout the focus groups. Just about every focus group has a participant, at least a participant that has experienced deportation of a loved one or friend. One participant expressed that the police create immigrants as monsters that undermine relationships with the police, obliterating any chance to build police-immigrant friendly relations. However, not all immigrants express fear of police. For example, at Casa Maranela, a focus group that was held behind a police station with sirens going on and off throughout the focus group Many of the participants said that they felt safe and were okay with the fact that police officers would come inside and question other immigrants that were staying in the house and take them away if they had criminal backgrounds. They were okay with the tenets of the criminal alien program. However, when later presented with 
the issue of misdemeanor arrests leading to deportation. Many contradicted their previous statements. This, of course, draws a disparity that the criminal alien program holds that the collaboration between jails and federal immigration helps to improve public safety. The focus groups, however, reveal, dis reveal the opposite. The stories coming out of the focus groups and our data show that contrary to its mission, CAP is not prioritizing dangerous criminals, but rather those with minor infractions. Finally, as a research team who are also community organizers trying to formulate new strategies, we've not only had to change our research design, but our approach to community organizing. Initially, we thought it would be very easy to prove how programs like this would create fear and mistrust between the community and the police. While, many, while we have found this to be true in many cases, some participants also expressed they, that they do agree with these programs. They found that they agree that dangerous criminals should be re reported, but not those for minor infractions. We realized that putting an end to this would require, putting an end to CAP would require a broad base of community support, which the research process directly and indirectly cultivates. The preliminary focus group process has been at the center of the shift in our approach. And I'll open it up to you, Patricia. Hi, everybody. My name is Patricia Zavala. I'm a community organizer with the Workers' Defense Project, and I'm also on the board of the Austin and Immigrant Rights Coalition. I'll be talking about a few of the components of the research process, um, as well as my own experience as an organizer going through the academic research process. After holding a few of these focus groups with immigrant communities that John was talking about, we quickly realized the power that these spaces created. Imagine a circle of immigrants sitting around commiserating about their shared experiences in this country. Personal testimonies and stories laden with fear and family separation. It shook the room with a sense of hopelessness. But at the same time, there was an overwhelming sense of unification, community, and empowerment. The coming together of these marginalized and isolated individuals to talk about the systemic abuses that they experience on an everyday level created an undeniably powerful force of unity. So after facilitating the first few focus groups, we realized the potential that these focus groups had as a consciousness raising and empowerment strategy. As an organizer, I couldn't help but to see these spaces as the grounds for building a powerful base for community mobilization. So why not connect the report to community mobilization? With this realization, we decided to move the campaign forward with a unified front of community support with immigrants playing a central, if not leading, role. It was this shared sentiment that led to the idea of directly integrating the immigrant community into the research process via focus group facilitation trainings. How do focus group facilitation trainings empower the immigrant community and mobilize at the same time while leading forward the research process? Well, facilitating a focus group requires a certain level of leadership. A facilitator must effectively guide the group conversation in a way that allows all to hear and be heard. This means that the facilitator must gracefully ask the quiet people to speak up and the excessive talkers to just listen. To become a facilitator, certain communication skills must be developed. This process of developing skills and learning how to effectively communicate amongst your community builds confidence and leadership through practice, the role of facilitation becomes a tool for empowerment. By teaching immigrants the facilitation skills needed to lead focus groups, they can go on to coordinate their own focus groups in their own communities. Eventually, when those who participate become engaged in the process, they are then motivated to teach others how to facilitate and lead, thus involving more in the process of empowerment. In addition, on a research level, this model generates a form of qualitative data that is unmatched to the type of information that a white academic facilitator would get from the focus group. People open up in a more candid way when they're amongst members of their own community than when they're in the presence of an outsider. I'm going to talk about the Austin Police Department because that <clears throat> came up in our research process. So. 
When, when asked in the focus groups if they could describe the difference between ICE and the police, many immigrants responded by saying that there was no difference. An overwhelming number of focus group participants expressed a fear of encountering the police for the possible consequences of being deported. From the perspective of an undocumented immigrant, a simple encounter with the police could result in their own deportation, like we heard from their story. It is this collective experiences and stories of deportation that lead to this fear. These findings forced us to consider APD's perspective. We went on to design a variety of research questions and to conduct three focus groups with the APD in which approximately 26 officers participated. The responses were unexpected and quite revealing. APD feels that their community outreach to the immigrant community is sufficient and effective. By having only one Hispanic community liaison on staff who puts friendly police advertisements in Spanish papers and addresses the Hispanic community on the radio and works on sponsoring community events, they seem to feel that they had a not so bad relationship with the immigrant population. In contrast, one immigrant in particular expressed that La Migra is a racist agency that carries out anti-immigrant policies of discrimination, detainment, and deportations, as Rose has effectively communicated. It is this blindness to their own indirect role as perpetrators of family separation and unwarranted deportation that is so powerful the drastic contrast of how these groups view their relationship to one another is like day and night. The disparity of perception is grand and our future work seeks to explore this further. I'm gonna briefly reflect on my experience as an organizer doing activist research. I just wanna share with y'all a little bit about my thoughts on the constraints of organizing within the rigid structure of the technocratic research process. I'm dedicated to this research project, not just to produce another academic report for the sake of putting my name on it, but to organize and mobilize. As an immigrant rights activist, this has been my motive all along. There was something that felt so wrong about taking the information that the immigrants shared with us and not doing anything meaningful with it. Throughout this process, I have constantly struggled to answer just one question. How can the research process empower the immigrant community when it is inherently an exclusionary process? There is the necessity of access to computers, internet, databases, and the command of the English language all necessary to carry out this type of research. I often feel that the report process can be excluding to the very people that it needs to empower and for their own leadership and in this case, the immigrants. Let me give just one brief example, the IRB. Who here is familiar with the IRB? Okay, <laughs> I, can, I can tell some of you. Well, during several of our ICE out committee meetings, there was a lot of debate and talk about something called the IRB. And I have to admit, I had no idea what this was, nor why my academic colleagues spent so much time talking about it. To me, it seemed like another elitist, exclusionary ploy to derail the hard work before us. Innocent people are being deported as we speak, and we're obsessing about the Institutional Review Board? I often feel this is a battle of legitimacy, where numbers and data have come to have more significance than personal testimonies and the shared stories of fear and deportation in the immigrant community. I question why institutions don't pay as much attention to legitimacy of individuals' personal experiences. Later, however, I began to learn that producing solid research held important implications for how our mobilization formed alliances with groups like the Austin Police Department and the Austin City Council. Our approach seeks to make the public law enforcement and the local and federal uh, government aware of the important issues by producing academically certified information. I've come to recognize that the use of an academic report can be a powerful tool for our mobilization. So for me, 
The entire report process has been a learning experience, fraught with frustrations and contradictions. And while I don't always see eye to eye with my academic comrades, I feel that we each learn from each other in a way that strengthens our struggle. I hope you've all enjoyed our presentation today. Hopefully some of you have been inspired to learn more and get involved. Uh, we have some very concrete ways in which people can get involved and work with us. Um, here are some of the descriptions up here. Uh, I'll just leave this up here so you can review it. Um, please feel free to come up and talk to us afterwards. We'd be happy to answer any questions. You can contact us at our email, geticeout at gmail.com. And um, I'm going to pass around a sign-up sheet for those that are interested. You can put down your name and we'll contact you. And I'll pass this around and we'll open it up to questions from the audience. I just had a question on, um, did you find any evidence or do you have testimonies of physical abuses that might be happening in the jails? That's not really like our focus on research. I know that a lot of other people do um, kind of research both see if um, like document abuses both in county jails and also in ICE immigration detention, which are two different things. But our report um, doesn't focus on, on that issue. Yes, one of the really interesting things that I could only highlight really briefly is that these CAP Secure Communities 287G, these are jail status check programs. but places with 287G has another component that, like I was saying, it allows on the ground agents to directly interrogate people about their immigration status. So places where 287G is operative, organizers tend to have a much easier time mobilizing around racism and against racial profiling. But that's also happened in places like Irving, Texas, where uh, the, the Warren Institute report that Andrea quoted showed that only 2% of the people picked up by CAP were for felonies, 98% um, were for misdemeanors. What's happened to the Jane and John Doe program that was instituted before Chief Acevedo got here, Stanley? What's going on with that? Where are all the players who supported and created that safety net? Because that program started in response to a marginalized immigrant community that was vulnerable for all types of criminalization being preyed upon. Jane and John Doe program was created back in the, I guess the early, late 80s, early 90s, by a group of, I wouldn't even say community activists, because that's not what we were calling ourselves at that time, but it was created by a group of social workers and several social service organizations that we're seeing the same problem across the board. And so when we finally got down to what the main problem was, and at that time it was workers being beat up on their way home from cashing their checks on Friday afternoons, resulting in a whole a drain on a whole bunch of social services, we sat down with Stan Nee, and Stan Nee, at Chief Nee at that time said, and it came from top down, this is why when I hear that APD is making these arrests, this is not, this has not been, the policy has always been from top down. We, Austin is a safe city and we are interested in getting the criminals, not anyone else who makes this an unsafe community. What has happened? I imagine that we'll go back to the APD if we do any more focus groups, but definitely in our interviews, we'll be sure to ask about this program. Do you guys, are there other groups doing work to change the conditions or practices at the county jail? And if so, how do you relate to those groups? I think that in 2008, that's, that's kind of where the alliance was at the organizational level. So there are quite a few organizations in Austin that were part of that initial campaign to put pressure on Sheriff Hamilton, like the ACLU, the Workers' Defense Project, and a lot of other organizations, but like, in 2008, it was just there at the organizational level. It wasn't really, um, you know, a, a, a mass mobilization of, of people from the community saying, like, this issue really bothers me. Um, do something about it. And so I think at this point, we are trying to get more community involvement to make it more of a powerful impact on, on changing, changing the dynamic in, in the city.
but yeah, originally in 2008, we had a lot of um, alliances and support with different groups in the city. And th those have kind of, I think the issue is for a lot of organizations has, has died out a little bit because we were there for a year, we were putting pressure on the sheriff, he got reelected by a pretty wide majority. And so I think people were feeling like, what else is there to do about this guy? What else can we do? And I think people gave up. So, so he was asking, yeah. what other groups here in Austin are doing similar right. sort of work? Right. You can really involve, not directly with ICE, but right. with immigrant detention more broadly. Um, yes, and there will be a wonderful panel of anti-detention organizers speaking in the next session in the Santa Rita room, if you would like to uh, join us. Um, there are a host of other organizations um, that came together around family detention. Um, the T-Don had a family detention center in Taylor, Texas, which is 30 miles from here, and that was sort of what, like, at the time represented the most egregious extension of the detention system. It seemed to just expand overnight. Um, and a really great coalition came together around that, and that has expanded to a broader sort of critique of, of the detention system. Um, and so we see ourselves very much as connected to the ICE Out project and that this is looking at how people enter the detention system and we're focusing on detention practices. So private um, the privatization of detention centers, the human rights abuses that are going on inside, their remoteness, the fact that people are transferred from the East Coast to the Valley in Texas where they're 3,000 miles from their legal counsel and from their loved ones and from people who can provide support. Um, so I think, I mean, Austin is actually really lucky to have a really broad spectrum of organizations approaching these issues from a lot of different angles. Because um, that, having lived other places in the U.S., I know that that does not exist other places. Secure Communities, 287G, um, there's a national call to action on immigration reform. However, we feel that uh, we're going there to uh, go before the Department of Justice and Homeland Security to look at the programs that are being uh, implemented. Uh, and specifically, uh, given the fact that the Director of Homeland Security is Janet Napolitano, which was the governor of Arizona. And so we've, you know, that state has all the experience that maybe some cities uh, and we'll be going from Phoenix, we'll be coming through Austin to Houston and then through some cities in the south. Uh, and so uh, we're asking that uh, we have some kind of, of uh, forum and coordination uh, for our visit, which will probably be March the 11th. I wanted to ask a question um, in response to sort of what you were saying about how given the kind of cooperation or sort of interest that you're having from the APD, um, that sort of, you said, I think it's hard to, to call them a racist organization or something like that. So I'm just curious about, I mean, I, I agree with you, which is maybe to say, not that that's not, maybe they are a racist organization, but sort of you can't go there. And what kinds of other ways of making a critique are you, are you kind of trying to come up with that um, might be more amenable to like a dialogue than that sort of naming? to hint that what they were doing is in a way racist. Um, there was a complete rejection of that notion. Um, and so it, it did present a big challenge to us. We had to actually restructure our questions. Um, but I feel that the biggest thing that we can do is to bridge that gap between how the APD views their relation to the community um, and and also make them more aware of how their arrests have these further, more grander implications of, of deportation. Um, right now there's a total disconnect between them arresting somebody and them realizing that, oh, that person's going to be deported because I arrested them because I didn't have a driver's license. So raising that awareness and that consciousness um, is one of the strategies that we're taking. And in our focus, when, when Patty and I facilitated these focus groups, we, we asked them that very directly and the responses were, were a bit shocking. They gave us everything from the bureaucratic line of, look, if, if we thought about the implications of arresting every single person on the street, then that's going to undermine public safety too. And others said, you know, I actually support these programs the way you're describing to if somebody gets deported, good, you know, they need to be. And then others, um, you know, were, you know, started to really ponder and say, huh, 
know, I never really thought about this. And so there's a spectrum of responses. But when we step back from the focus groups, met up in, in our um, qualitative research team to reflect on the implications of what we were finding, we got a little bit uneasy about are we really going to make that bridge? Are we going to do the hard work of, of making APD's job with the community even better? Are we, in other words, as an organization, going to improve police work? And there's, so we, we have a lot of uneasiness. Here in Travis County, um, we have a law on the books called uh, theft of service. Um, this is can be applied to somebody who goes and does a job and then they're not paid for their for their work and so it's a criminal offense you can report the crime and APD will prosecute as if this person were a criminal so so patrones who aren't paying their day laborers can can be persecuted as criminals the only thing is that it's it's quite a process to get to that point um, and it requires the undocumented immigrants to come forward to the police and make a theft of service report now you know considering all of this who's going to want to go forward to the police and say hey you know i didn't get paid and they're like okay you know let me look at your uh identification and so there's just this fear nobody wants to actually go forward to the police they'd be incriminating themselves um, so it does play a really big role in um, resolving uh, unpaid wages and recuperating wages, and um, this, you know, this leads to the further um, exploitation of of immigrant labor. So it, you know, it, that's a really good question. It does have a big effect on the community.